Hello, everyone, and welcome to CCI's latest webinar on joint partner planning. I'm Peter Hornberger, and I'm joined today by Stephen Kellum uh, with CCI and Diane Krikora of Partner Path. And today we are going to talk about joint partner planning. We wanted to uh, tee this up really by talking a little bit about the challenges that led us to this discussion. And, and that really lies in the fact that there is a constant changing landscape among uh, channel partners. And there's a lot of questions surrounding, uh, I have limited resources, who do I focus on? I have uh, constantly new partners cropping up. Should I be investing in those partners? Are they potential growth partners for me? And we really, uh, we really tie this into the analogy of a farm, where you have to be looking uh, uh, forward thinking and looking at, uh, you know, what is, uh, what is coming in, or what, what do I need to be preparing, who are my potential uh, growth partners that can become key stars, and what do I need to do to water and grow those relationships over time. So we're going to dive into, into the process and really the outcome of that process for um, how to solve this challenge. This is uh, the second part of a two-part webinar series that we've done. The first part was a few months ago, and we did it on partner scorecarding. And partner scorecarding is really the first step that bleeds into joint partner planning. We see it as a, as a couple things. It first is a way to select the partners to focus on. By looking at a scorecard, you can get an accurate understanding of what partners are already distinguishing themselves as growth partners and moving towards my top points here. Those are the partners we want to focus on. The second component of scorecarding is these are a, a great base for your joint partner planning. You can look at some of these metrics and see how uh, by getting up out of your cube and going and meeting with your partners, you can greatly expound on these metrics themselves. And we're going to dive a little bit more into what that looks like when we get into the process slides. And this is a look at today's agenda. We're going to start by reviewing some current trends and research, talk a little bit about how people are moving into a more automated fashion of doing this, moving past uh, spreadsheet methods like the CHAMP plan. Then we're going to get into the process itself. We're going to talk about what we see as the three key areas of joint partner planning. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how to differentiate that process across different partner tiers. Uh, as you have partners of different sizes going after different markets, we do think that there's a distinction in the way that you need to attack joint partner planning with those different tiers. So let's get into it. The first thing we're going to look at today is current trends and research, and Diane's going to kick us off uh, in this area. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Wanted to bring some recent data uh, to this conversation. In our eighth year of the State of the Partnering Study, which we just finished, and which will be out uh, later in, uh, next week, we asked vendors, what are your major plans to grow partner profitability in 2014? And out of the 187 vendors that responded to this year's study, over 50% of them indicated that engaging in business planning was their primary activity that they were going to focus on for growing their partner profitability. So that's, this is the second year in a row that business planning has topped the priority list around the vendors for what they're looking to do with, with partners. And beating out, barely, but still beating out lead generation, which is something that we've seen for the last 10 years, really top of the charts, you know, we're going to drive leads. So it's definitely on top of mind with all the vendors out there. Yeah, Diane, I totally agree with you. I think uh, one of the things that we run into often, and question that gets asked around a slide like this is, is why. And uh, we have unanimous, not unanimously, but so often heard with our, uh, with our clients, uh, whether they're calling it the year of the partner or whether uh, creating uh, partner delight, there just seems to be a re-emphasis on um, doing things really well for the, for the partners. And I, I, and I totally understand that, right? We want to maximize the value of the channel. We want to increase revenues. We want to leverage that channel to be as successful as possible. I do think one of the most interesting comments that I heard at a recent conference as people were discussing their investment of time into, into activities like this, uh, one person finally stood up and said, well, one of the reasons we're doing it is because if we're not doing it, our competitors are doing it, and the fact is, a lot of you, owe, uh, a lot of you, uh, have overlap in your partners, and and this is just going to happen. People are, are really trying to get more engaged with the partners. I thought it was a pretty honest and uh, very realistic response. Okay, uh, and it's a challenge, 
And I think everybody realizes the challenge, which is why it's so important to have a really good process in place and so important to have the scorecarding, the, the foundation uh, laid out, because the reality is while the vendors, uh, Diane, everything that we hear and everything that you hear and everything you see uh, really talk about uh, the emphasis on planning, the challenge is that the partners, many of them just aren't ready. And if you look at this slide, I think it's some great data. Now, the 25% of uh, the channel has no business plan. You know, a lot of that may be in the S&B, and it may not affect some vendors, but if, uh, if you're a vendor that's recently launched a $10,000, sub-$10,000 $10, product and you've onboarded thousands of new partners, this is really big. Uh, I think the other one is when you get to the 65% uh, lacking a sales development plan or, or a business development plan. I think there's a, I know that there's a big difference between that business plan and the business development sales development plan. And the reality is a lot of these partners, uh, their sales and operations outgrow their marketing capabilities and their, their growth business plans. And this is where the vendors have a great opportunity to step in and really do some things really well for the partners. I think this is why we've seen such a growth in uh, TPMA through partner marketing agencies, because what they're able to do is come in and really help fill that gap and provide the uh, marketing services that the partners need and the, uh, allow the vendors to really, uh, really leverage the, the partners for growth. Okay. Uh, another piece is into this puzzle is the fact that uh, the planning and the uh, and the way that things are planned really just aren't for the top ten anymore. Uh, historically, we've had lots of conversations with vendors who have been using CHAMP plans, which are the uh, sort of large uh, spreadsheet-driven plans, and really focus on the top tiers, uh, or the, not even the top tiers, the top partners within the top tier. And what we're hearing and what we're seeing is a really strong desire to get beyond that top ten and to really do more work going down into the, the various tiers. And as we go through this, I think you'll see as we've got some things laid out, there, we, we, we built three tiers, and, and all of you are going to identify your tiers a little bit differently. But we're going to talk about what happens, the similarities within those tiers, and give you guys some process on how you can be successful within uh, each of those tiers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and when we're talking about business planning, what we're really doing is we're looking at designing a future together. So we've got a little bit of a different methodology, and we've tried to line the tiers up against it to say if you're designing a future together, you want to understand where there's an investment and that you're going to put in, and it's going to produce a greater return. So we're really looking at the possibility or the opportunity of the partnership in a go-forward manner rather than, as we looked in scorecarding a couple of months ago, we looked at past performance. So this, in this graph, what we're really talking about is on the, what's the measure of your time, your investment in your time, in the return of that relationship. And we have partners that take a lot of our time but don't return much in terms of revenue or entrance into new markets, new verticals, et cetera. So an investment on the time on the, the horizontal scale is kind of far out there, but the partner return or the revenue return, as we're measuring it in here, isn't very great. Those, you know, either they're partners we call them in the growth, if they're just kind of starting out with us, they're not returning a lot yet, but they're also not a large investment, and those that are a huge investment but not returning a lot. But the goal is to discover which these partners that will turn into those top performers um, and focus your business planning on those guys they may have the most opportunity for continuing to help drive your business forward. Again, we've overlaid the traditional three-level model on this quadrant discussion to give you a rough idea of where partners typically fall, even though we see um, all four quadrants in each tier at some times. Right? So you can see partners that are in, you know, a, a growth stage with you at each level. The at-risk investments really is just a conversation that says you're putting a lot of 
time and effort into partners where they're demanding a lot of your time and they're not yet producing a lot. So the question there is, are these people worthy of the time? Are they, in the business planning sense, are they going to grow in terms of that output that you're expecting from them? I think top performers are pretty clear. They may be, you may be giving a lot of their time, your time, um, either demanded by them or a collaborative activities where you're investing a lot of time in them, and but they're producing greatly for you. The conversation gets uh, interesting when we're talking about mature partnerships. Everybody says, hey, well, they're not taking a lot of their time, but they're producing a lot of revenue for us. That's great, isn't it? Yes, it is. As these are guys that may not want a lot of your time. Some of them, we think of them as um, DMRs or that they're, 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 they're rolling in their business model without really even wanting a lot of your time. So when we're talking about business planning and a future action of growing together, you may not also want to spend a lot of your time in business planning with those guys. Again, we see them at that gold level, right? We will see top performers and these guys that are producing a lot of revenue for us but aren't really engaged in us as an organization. So just a, a model of looking forward uh, against your kind of tiers, which are traditionally more performance-based. Yeah, and, and Diane, I think the only thing I would add to that is we've seen such a differentiation between um, some vendors as of late in, in whether their emphasis is on revenue growth uh, or whether it's on perhaps enablement and, and uh, getting the partners uh, in the best position to succeed moving forward. And I've seen organizations that are sticking to they were really strong on the revenue piece. That's where we want to go. We'll get that enablement piece as we, uh, we go through it. Uh, to the 180 where we've had conversations with vendors uh, where they literally said, we're, we're putting a stop to this, and everything is about enablement and all our rewarding and all our emphasis on that, and we believe that that's the way we need to be looking at this now and judging these folks, and we will get the reward in the end because we're really investing, investing that time and we'll end up on the revenue. So I, I think how each uh, – uh, vendor is, is looking at uh, or what side of it of that coin vendors on really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. Thank you, Stephen and Diane. I think that really helps in identifying what we're trying to accomplish with joint partner planning. <clears throat> so for our next section, uh, let's get into the actual process and, and how we select which partners to do this with, what we actually do during one of those meetings, and then how to further incent them to uh, to work towards the goals that you set up in those meetings. I did want to highlight at this point as, as we get into this, I, I, you know, we are trying to provide a succinct overview of the process. Um, I know that you guys will have questions uh, as we drill into this. So we do have uh, some time set aside at the end of this. If you'd like to ask questions, there is a section here on Bright Talk to enter your questions, and we will spend some time answering those at the end. So I wanted to highlight that as we get into the meet. If you do have questions, please go ahead and ask, and we will get to those at the end. And Stephen and Diane are going to take us through uh, through this section and kind of give us an overview of what we're going to look at, and then we'll dive into each of the three key areas. Okay. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, realistically, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit, or we're going to talk a little bit here at CCI about the scorecarding and then onto the joint marketing piece. And Diane's going to take us through the the real processes around around the planning. And, and we have the partner and scorecarding piece in here, even though we did a webinar on this, a very thorough webinar on this uh, several weeks ago. And the reason we have it in there is, one, not everybody, I'm sure, attended that previous webinar. And two, uh, scorecarding, uh, partner scorecarding is such a foundation and, and, and so important to, as a level set to get to who you need to do planning with that we just thought it was really important to show that as the first step. And we'll go into some more detail on partner scorecarding uh, on some of the upcoming slides. Yeah, and on the areas around working with your partners to actually create the plan, it really depends upon where the partner sits in that maturity model we just discussed in terms of um, the mode. Is it in person, over the phone, or online? The frequency in which you have um, a business planning conversation and actually review that business plan. And the team that, invol that is involved in that, that all changes depending upon kind of where you are in that maturity model and what your, your goals are. Um, what doesn't change on all of this is 
that this discussion is led by the partner account manager. And the challenge or really the deficit that we see here is that the, most of the partner account managers um, rarely uh, understand in depth a partner business model. It's very difficult to sit down with an exec that has been running their own VAR for 20 years um, if you really don't understand the difference between margin versus markup. So even though there's a lot of ongoing process here around business planning, we like to emphasize as well, this is truly driven by the PAM, and that person really needs to understand a partner's business model, particularly as we go into cloud, and that what that does to things like cash flow and hiring activities and how the, what the partner, how the partner makes money and how that really affects what that partner may do with you, again, in a future growth area, rather than, you know, past performance, but where you guys are going together. And we'll talk more about the mode, frequency, and team involved. Okay. And, and then on the joint marketing planning piece, we're going to touch briefly on that today. The, the focus really is on the actual business planning. But we wanted to lay out, as I said, the uh, scorecarding piece is the foundation uh, to set up who you're going to plan with. We're going to go into quite a bit of detail on the plan itself, and then we're going to talk about once the plan is done, the execution in particular on the marketing side is, is absolutely critical, and that's its own webinar in itself that's going to be coming down the pipe, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the do's and don'ts on the joint marketing planning as well. Great. Thanks, guys. So, uh, so Stephen, you want to kick us off on our first area, partner scorecarding? Sure, and I, I'll keep it pretty simple. I think the message that we have gotten very, very clearly, in particular over the last six months, is everybody's doing this, right? And everybody, and let me rephrase that. Everybody's trying to do this really well. People have been doing, uh, vendors have been doing scorecarding uh, since the beginning of the channel. What has been really interesting, and we covered a lot of this in our previous scorecarding uh, webinar, was how people are now aggressively really trying to dig in. Uh, as you started with, with Peter talking about limited resources, uh, best value of time, finding who those key partners are. Uh, we really need to have a great process and, and a really strong scorecarding. As a matter of fact, we've had so many conversations over the past six months about how can we help vendors not only determine uh, how to scorecard or, or what to scorecard, but even how do we create a better tool for that? And how do we create not just a process, but a, a lot of vendors are seeking an, uh, an automated tool, once again, getting away from spreadsheets and trying to make it so that data is more transparent, um, is easier to move into other areas for analytics, and, and really trying to make scorecarding uh, much, much more effective. The, uh, the main slide that we had out of the previous webinar was really about the four quadrants of the scorecarding. And as we move into the planning side, I, I think our focus and the way we look at this now is moving up and to the right. And actually, I would take that line that I have on the right-hand side that's circled around there and maybe even pull that up a little if I could do it over again. And the reality is, as you get out of the cube and as you spend time uh, digging into the, the, the pieces that take more effort to get the good information from the partners, it's going to be mind share, business models, business planning, the end user satisfaction way up to the right-hand side. But the, the gist of it is we're moving up and to the right and trying to really capture that data that's going to make for a positive business plan. And it's going to make for not just a positive business plan, but a positive business plan that's going to be realistic, executable, and measurable. Thanks, Stephen. All right, Dan, let's, uh, let's move to our second area and, and actually talk about what goes into these business planning sessions. Great. Thank you, Peter. And I want to really highlight that there are there were three key words on that last piece, and we'll go into the structure. It was a shared business and plan. So first is shared, that this is a conversation that is it's a joint collaborative conversation, and we'll talk a lot about that and the team that's in this collaborative conversation. It is a plan. I think I've hit this a couple of times today. This is a forward-looking idea. And then it's really all about the business that you guys are doing together. We talked a little bit about the frequency and the team changes to align with the partner opportunity that you see in the future. In the top performers, that upper right-hand quadrant, 
you'll want long-range planning and a large team from both sides. Um, you're really looking at innovative ways to continue to grow profitability together. These are the guys that are not just producing revenue, but uh, have that also opportunity to move into new markets, new solutions, new services. You know, you're, these are a top performer in the true sense of the word. So we, we like to see a long-term annual planning process that has both sides sit down for a fairly significant meeting. So we're talking a half day. We'd love to have breaking bread involved in that as well. And uh, a, a in-depth discussion that aligns with, you know, each side's really f future focus and go-to-market. Then we're going to kind of drop down to those at-risk partners or at-risk investments. So those that are taking a lot of your time but not yet uh, returning results in terms of the partnership. Here we just – we suggest that at this level just the PAM – the partner account manager uh, is the primary person, and often we see it's just the partner account manager, and that's why them really understanding the whole business model is really important. And we say just the PAM because we don't want to really invest a lot more time in these guys that are already sucking a lot of your organization's time, be that through requests and services or a lot of sales efforts or, you know, um, high – operational or processes, we, we want to see uh, if, in a business planning process, if you're aligned, right? And, and we think this should happen quarterly because we want to we check in to see if we're going to grow into top performers or if these types of partners should really be dropped. Um, we call this the up or out. They're taking a lot of time um, from your team, from your organization. Are they going to have the possibility, do you guys align strategically to move them up into the top performers? Are they going to start executing? Maybe it just hasn't been enough time. Are they going to start executing, or are, are these guys just really not a fit for your business and need to move out? And then as they move up, then we get back into the top performer, and we get the bigger long-range team. Now, Business planning with the so far so good. Any question? Okay. Business planning with the mature partnerships. This can be done with a fewer people, as you're looking to continue a stream of ongoing revenues, but you're not really expecting growth or innovation from these guys. I think mature mature partnerships says a lot about it. That these these are guys that almost came out of top performers and then are, you know, kind of back into that mature partnership that they're not requiring or, or needing a lot of your, your time. And in fact, they don't even necessarily want a lot of your time. Um, they're going to produce that stream of revenue no, no matter what you do. And a lot of times we see these guys that are mature partnerships don't want to do business planning. <clears throat> so that kind of separates. They, you, you can't schedule it. You know, they, they don't want to play. But the ongoing business reviews with them is more of what we would call almost a monthly cadence of looking on existing accounts and existing business that's going to, to happen there. And that can happen at various levels. We, we talk about that as an account level, but also really a sales level. We really want that activity to be happening in the field on a monthly kind of sales pipeline cadence. <clears throat> cool for the structure? Yes. Great. On to the process. Um, this is a, a, it looks like, like a complex or a, a, a timeline, but it's a, it's a fairly simple process. It's prep, uh, pr preparation, do the plans, review, and then repeat. And just as a little bit more detail, there's always preparation. What we really suggest is that in your first time that you're doing planning, particularly with some of those partners that you haven't done planning before, right? Um, Stephen mentioned that we used to do only like 10 partners, not even top 10%, but 10 partners. And we're really seeing the pressure to do more business planning further down the tiers and, and with, with much more, many more partners to, to discover those growth partners. So when you're going to start having these 
business planning discussions, we recommend that you're able to send the blank business planning, whatever template you guys are using, um, uh, be that a document, be that an online template, four-page fill-in-the-blank business plan, whatever kind of template that you're going to use to really manage the discussion around your shared future. Send that to your partner with the expectations so that they understand what data they're going to need to bring to the table, what information they may have to gather it from the services team, they may have to talk to um, the support teams. So there, there may be groups within the partner that they have to gather information from and being able to set that expectation. Of course, then the goal is to sit down and have a plan. Uh, in some of the lower levels, when we see we're getting out of the gold and into the silver levels of your partners, we may not be able to actually um, get to them face-to-face. -face. That might be a lot of traveling. We always love face-to-face -face meetings, but sometimes we see these, you know, WebEx over the phone, you know, being able to do that plan to, to sit down. And that that's not an hour-long meeting. These are several hours of discussions around where you're going together in the future and how do your organizations align. Then there is a review process that you may have had as a partner account manager, we talked about that in, you know, kind of in these up or out, these at-risk investments. The partner account manager, you're having that conversation. Typically, we see that go to an executive level review from that business plan so that you're having more exposure within your organization as a vendor as to, you know, what you're planning to do with your partners and because you may need uh, other resources within your organization. You may need sales resources, marketing people, you know, kind of your own virtual team to help um, execute on these plans. So there tends to be a review process that may have an iterative revision to it. The partner may also have some go back to their organization and have some iterative reviews uh, and, and revision to that plan. And then the, the time to sit down and uh, after the plan has been put in place, you know, you need to execute on that. That's the hard part that nobody ever talks about. Oh, we had a plan, now we have to execute on it. And then to review, um, did we meet plan? So then we've got actual to plan. Did we get everything accomplished? And it tends to be, most people talk about it as a quarterly business plan, but we also see it um, as uh, not, you know, Sometimes quarterly happens too quickly. It depends upon how many partners you have and, and what, what you're really trying to accomplish. So we, we do see some different time structures there in terms of how often that, that happens. Again, I want to stress the words that there is collaborative here and that this is a living document, that there is a lather, rinse, repeat activity going on here, that you're, you're, you're continuing to change a business plan um, at every iter iteration as you learn more about each other and you continue to align in the shared future. Great. That, that's fantastic. Thank you, Diane, for the uh, just the practical <coughs> application of how to conduct these meetings. Uh, the last area we wanted to cover, and, and Stephen's going to take us through this, is, uh, is joint marketing planning. And, and uh, after you've had these meetings, how to, to incent and further motivate partners through joint marketing planning. Thanks, Peter. And, and Diane hit on a, a key word, and, uh, well, it wasn't ROI, but ROI obviously is a key <laughs> word. But execution uh, is, is the key word that, that she uh, hit on. Uh, and, I've, and I've seen this, we've seen this, where uh, the greatest plans are laid out, uh, and, the, and there's a the, the weakness is addressed, but then the question, particularly around uh, marketing capabilities, but then there's a question of, then what do we do about that, right? And I'm sure many on the phone have uh, tried for partner marketing. Uh, they've had business plans where they talk about the uh, the partners actually doing their own marketing, um, have, have seen challenges around those. And I do believe that that's given such a rise to the through partner marketing uh, that, that's going on today. And even with the through partner marketing, uh, many vendors realizing that uh, they need some help and they're pulling in these uh, through partner marketing agencies, the folks like Zift or uh, Elastic Digital or Veritech, and, and creating simplicity for the partners in their execution. And I think that ties very, very well into the, quote, year of the partner or the emphasis on making the partner's life easier, delighting the partner. But having expectations in return that we're going to do this 
uh, and that the partner's going to grow. And the key out of all of this is the ROI side of it. And along with having these scorecarding conversations and what are we going to do for business planning, uh, many of the conversations we're having today are, okay, we've done all that. We do the execution. How are we now tying back measurables to this? So those of us in marketing, uh, product planning, uh, uh, are, are able to look at what we've done and, and judge as being successful. And, and the good news is whether it's through a TPMA, whether it's through the efforts of the vendor themselves, we are now able to see so much more visibility coming back into uh, the vendor system on what the partners have done so that then that can not only be shared with the partner but can be shared with the, the individuals in the vendor organization who are making decisions on whether to invest again with the partner because we could build these great plans, and I, I, I'll go back to the execution piece is key, but I think another piece that, uh, that uh, Diane touched on that's really key is repeat. This is, a, this is a repeatable process that we're trying to build here, and, uh, and it really needs to be something that uh, can have some analytics behind it, and then it becomes something that's predictive for what's going to happen in the future as well, uh, whether that's done manually or whether that's done through some sort of automated system. Uh, this is just a brief slide that helps look at some of those activities and how to group them together. We look at the sales process between the awareness, the interest, the desire, the actual transactions. It's just a nice takeaway that shows some of those activities and the metrics behind them, uh, and these are the real uh, tactical pieces that roll up under that uh, joint marketing plan. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons to do automation, which we see, we hear more and more desire for automation of uh, joint marketing planning, automation for scorecarding. It's really simple. We keep seeing more people. I take that back. We keep seeing less people at the vendors being asked to do more. Uh, we see growth in the channel. We see growth in leveraging the channel. Uh, numbers uh, put on top of the channel and even in marketing that weren't there before. And it really becomes a prioritization of time and efforts. And, and this is just a slide that talks a little bit about moving away from an unwieldy spreadsheet into something that is a, a more automated process and allowing, uh, allowing folks to, to focus their time more strategically. Something like a joint marketing planner. CCI happens to have a joint marketing planner. Uh, it's an automated process, but whatever the process, whether it's a spreadsheet or an internal uh, effort or whether it's something from someone like CCI, the reality of what you are trying to accomplish is the same thing. Uh, when you do move to automation, you are able to get a couple of benefits. You're able to get uh, standard drop down, standardization, normalization of data. Uh, your reporting is going to be easier because it's going to be the, the data that's coming back in is going to be much more are structured. Uh, but e either, either way, there's definitely a step uh, and, and keys that you want to hit as you walk through uh, a joint marketing planner. Thanks, Stephen. So we have uh, one more uh, agenda item today, the, the last section we're going to go to, and, and that's really taking a look at uh, after we've defined what the process is, deciding how to apply that process against different tierings. I think that there is, uh, is a drastic change as you move from your traditional tiering of maybe bronze, silver, or gold, or whatever those names may be that, that, you're, uh, that, that you're grouping your partners by. And so we wanted to look specifically at, at how does this process change as we move across those tiers. And Stephen uh, is going to take us through this, and, and Diane's going to provide some color commentary. Yeah, I, I think this is really interesting because, uh, you know, bronze, silver, and gold, standard ways of breaking this up, but it's obviously different for, for everyone that's here. Uh, if you're a vendor who has a uh, product that's solely focused on mid-market and up, it's a little bit different. So again, if you're a, a vendor who has uh, $10,000 under products, works a lot in the SMB, it's going to be a little bit different as well there. So what we try to do is just create – uh, just some key points around all three tiers and, and some things to, to think about and, and to, lo to look at. Uh, from a description, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The small VARs, the, the MSPs, uh, these resellers who are either lifestyle or early entrants. There's a reason that they're in that uh, bronze category. However, uh, Diane's slide, my favorite slide out of this whole presentation, the four quadrants that has the growth, the, the stars, the, the guys that are on the bench, and the mat maturation – you're going to find those in these, these uh, categories. And even in the bronze, you're going to find a lot of those. The challenge with the bronze is because so often they're unmanaged, uh, and there's so many of them, it, it's just hard to, to get to who is that star. I think the reason to invest in them 
is because so many of the stars of tomorrow are going to be uh, coming out of this uh, out of this this level. In particular, if we're talking about cloud uh, cloud integrators or uh, some of the younger generation in the in, in the resellers. So, um, a couple of tips on this one. While it's really challenging to do it, some face to faces are good, and this is where uh, the um, the scorecarding is so important. When you're looking at all of these small players, and, and you know, let's say there's 2,000 of these guys, well, you can look at top 100 MSPs uh, in, in CRM and, and see who those guys are, right? You could see who some maybe those bronze guys are that you should visit. And when you go visit them, uh, you need to get a, a, a sense of where they're going. If we're going in and seeing a small partner, yet they have a conference room that's set up really, really well so they can do uh, lunch and learns and seminars. Uh, they've got KPIs hanging from the ceiling that really show details so that when their clients are coming in, they're really impressed about what sort of support they can deliver. You know, the, the guy's got a, a nice shirt on and a nice pair of khakis. But they're built to run a business, and those are going to be the guys who you want to invest in. And I don't know any way you find that out without going and seeing them, right? Whether it's Disney's going to see them or whether uh, it's, it's you going to see them, uh, we need to take some time and we need to visit some of these guys. Uh, the middle group, the, uh, the, the tier twos, uh, the, the silvers, uh, you know, these guys have grown, most cases have grown out of uh, either the, the bronze or they've come out of maybe the larger groups and, and created this, this group in the middle. To me, the most interesting piece I've seen uh, about this group is they tend to have a very, the guys that have become very successful, uh, have tended to become specialists in some way. And whether that's a vertical or some sort of category, they've really created a niche that's allowed them to get up to that next level. And I think one of the keys out of this, and Diane and I were talking about this, is really understanding what that is and being able to go talk to that partner in their language. And, and that takes some preparation on the vendor's part. And uh, I've seen horror stories where uh, vendors have gone in and weren't prepared and literally were telling somebody who had spent 10 years growing a great business uh, they needed to change what they did. Uh, the other side of it is folks who've taken the time to understand, say, a banking vertical uh, where someone has become extremely successful and they've gone from being uh, a, a local to a regional 15-state player or, uh, or half of the coast. Uh, you know, that really pays, pays huge dividends. Uh, Diane, any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, the, the, the silver, um, this is really uh, is the middle uh, – Tier and it crosses all four quadrants. I mean, you talked a lot. Of, you talked about that in, in in bronze as well. But we see so often that this middle tier has your growth partners in it. Those that are kind of that you know either upper out guys that what we call them at risk investments. Top performers are hidden in here a lot, and then some of the your mature partners. So this is like for us the holy grail of business planning. The top partners, the top player tier that we're going to get to in a minute, that's a given, right? This is like where you're going to find those rising stars, your diamonds in the rough. Your future is in this middle tier. Um, your future, of, you know, it's not your past, but your your future is here and. You know, this is our main focus when we're talking about extending business planning, really leveraging those partner account managers to, to understand and significantly uh, work with these guys. This is this is this is this is our bread and butter right here, where we think that um, for business planning. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, this is the fun place. But even in these guys, <laughs> one of the interesting things that I've seen, Diane, is, is why there's such a synergy between where the vendors want to go and where the partners are is because I've seen many of these organizations who have grown very well from a sales and an operational perspective but uh, have lagged behind in the marketing piece and really need uh, efforts, whether it's their social media platforms that they need help with, uh, whether it's funded headcounts to go into continue to their rise, uh, whether it's just uh, uh, content that they need, demos, whatever it may be. Uh, this, this is, I agree with you. This is a fun place to be. Yeah, talking to these guys and business planning is really where you find out what they need and, you know, kind of where they're aligned and what, you know, 
everybody's all the, the partners' organizations are different. Some of them have marketing skills. Some of them don't have marketing skills, right? So it's having that business conversation is like where do you guys as two organizations come together to fill the gaps to be able to really accelerate uh, the business into either new markets, uh, new opportunities, go out and hunt, you know, hunt for net new business. So this is this is our our, our sweet spot. Well, I mean, the fun spot for the for what we're talking about business planning. Yeah, I think both. So, <laughs> and when we go to that top tier, uh, the top level in the program typically is a combination of you know, mature partners. They do a lot of volume with you no matter what you do, right? That's what we call those mature partners. No matter if you give them a lot of resources or no resources in terms of your time and investment, these guys are going to turn a big volume. That's probably why they're a gold partner. And there's also some combination in there of these top performers, those that are driving you into new opportunities, developing new markets, creating full solutions, putting your products together in a full suite of full solution. So the key to business planning at this top level in your program is to realize that all partners are not created equal. And to invest in your executive time with those that align with you and your, you know, how do you guys align what we would consider go-to-market goals? Um, a portion of these guys will not, as I mentioned earlier, will not want to do business planning with you. Don't force it. I know that might be, a, you know, a really crazy idea. But if you're having a hard time doing um, strategic, long-range business planning, very different than scorecarding and talking about monthly performance. We're not talking about monthly um, pipeline planning here. We're talking about long-term strategic planning, right? Are we going in the same direction? Are we building our businesses together? Are we making that investment to build together? If you have gold partners that do not want to do planning with you, do not force it. They're not your future. Remember, again, this is a design of a future together. So there are there will be a lot of gold partners that are have based their business on you. They're basing their future business on you. They're making investments in you and in technology around you so that they continue to grow. Those are the guys you want to go spend the day with, um, have dinner, drink some wine, and really plan, you know, how you're going to grow not only in this next year but in the next five years together. What investments, what long-term investments are you making? And that's kind of the, what we consider those that the key to, to planning with those goals. Where are we developing a joint offering together? Where are we really going to market together? Is it a solution? Is it, you know, um, an overall – are we putting a bundle together? Is it a particular – bundle for uh, a partner set, and, and uh, that's kind of some of the keys to the goals. Go ahead. Please. Sorry. The, the only last point I would add on that is uh, one of the things that I've seen that's key making this successful is uh, in, you assume that there's an internal alignment, but making sure marketing and sales and product, everyone is on the same page as you're going through that process that Diane's talking about is huge. Because one of the things that we're seeing is, let's say an organization goes from rewarding mostly on co-op and from accrual, and it, it's kind of the status quo thing, and then they, they flip it over and they say, we're driving enablement is the key for every single of our, one of our partners. And by the way, if you are not, as a goal partner from your revenue perspective, if you do not participate in the enablement side of things to the degree that we feel that you have to at that level, you will not be a goal partner moving forward even though you have that revenue. That's a hard conversation, and what's really hard is if the marketing, the CAMS, PAMS, the executives, whoever, go out and have that conversation, set that agenda, the first person who's going to get a call is the VP of sales from the, from the CEO of that organization saying, what in the world are you doing to me? And if there's not an alignment internally for the organization to support themselves, those programs don't work. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I just see a lot of that going on as more enablement, more rewards are being addressed towards enablement that some of those conversations are happening. So just kind of, kind of something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. We even highlighted here there are much multiple touch points across both organizations, and they are extremely complex and intertwined and also, uh, often very global organizations. 
Thank you, Diane, Stephen. So uh, briefly want to go through just a recap and then we'll get to some questions. I see we've got a few here. So in summary, we, we have a challenge. There are limited resources. The partner landscape is ever changing and we're trying to identify the rock stars of tomorrow, um, both uh, in general across all tiers. How can we move partners across tiers, but also how can we identify the rock stars within each tier and, and further push them so that they will uh, begin to move up those tiers uh, over time with your organization. There's a process that we've laid out. It starts with selecting partners through scorecarding, uh, conducting uh, business reviews, and then finally motivating and incenting partners to keep them on track and, and, uh, and push their marketing efforts farther so that they are attaining new business and, and grabbing more market share. It's also important to identify across your partner tiers, uh, you know, where are your top performers, what are the, the, the partners that you need to focus on within those groups. Um, you know, we highlighted that silver is really the place where you're going to find your partners of tomorrow. And as you do that, the outcome that you're going to get is you're going to move more partners from your, your growth partners to your top performers as we look at this quadrant. You're going to stop wasting money on the partners that aren't driving lift. That would be uh, oftentimes you're at risk in your mature partners. You're going to gain clear, measurable ROI to understand where do my partners really sit and what are my investment dollars doing for me. And you're also going to increase engagement with partners and, and, and drive more loyalty towards your products, towards you as a, as a vendor, and, uh, and push partners to want to engage with you more. And so let's move into a few questions that we have. Let me pull this up. Um, people did ask, uh, are there going to be copies of this, uh, of this presentation available? We will make this available. There will be a recording here on Bright Talk. We can also send out copies of the presentation itself. Uh, one question, and Diane, you might be able to answer this the best, is we'd love to hear recommended resources for developing a best-in-class business plan. Are there things out there, Diane, is the answer to call and talk to you? What would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> of course. No. Um, there are, you guys just cheat off so easily. There are, there are templates out there. There is one, there's a template for free on our website, right, a business plan. It is a basic template. Of course, our suggestion is to always customize that to meet your needs and your growth. But there are a lot of templates out there in the world around um, on like, the elements that are included in a in a business plan. Um, and as I mentioned, if you go out on our our site and search for business plan, there is a free one you can download. Um, have fun. But uh, we also, of course, think that you should enhance that to meet the needs of your different types of partners. You may do different planning with your growth partners and different planning with your top performers than you're going to do with your at-risk investments, et cetera. So um, uh, we way, always Diane, want to see that. That was a legitimate question, right? We, we didn't, we didn't uh -huh. make that one up. Someone asked, like, uh -huh. asked that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and transparency is always <laughs> I appreciate it either way. Yeah. We've got another question here that says, any suggestions on business planning for renewals? Margins are low. And, Stephen, do you have uh, an answer for that? Well, um, for, on our side, renewals is part of an overall business model and an overall um, reseller's engagement with you. Uh, so we're looking at renewals as part of the business and hopefully not their only business. If, if I would say if renewals is the only business of a partner that you're working with, I wouldn't bother business planning with them. A renewal, because uh, you're, again, forward-looking. How are you guys going to co-create a shared vision together in the future? If, if it's a, if it's a, a mature relationship, and they're just processing just, and I put that in finger quotes, processing um, uh, renewals, which which is you know a good volume business. That investment in business planning just for those that specific feature is not probably worth it in terms of your time of a sit down meeting. But that monthly cadence of sales, as we talked about in that mature relationships, it's definitely something that you'd want to um, continue. Yeah, I think that gets into, Diane, I think you're right, gets into the value versus fulfillment side of things, and um, depending on what the product mix is, uh, where, the, where the emphasis is. All right, 
uh, one more question and then we'll wrap up is, uh, is who should be involved in uh, these business planning sessions from the, from the partner side? I think, Diane, one of your slides highlighted um, who to involve uh, on the vendor side, who you should bring along, um, but, but who should be targeted for uh, getting on the partner side involved in these meetings? Steve, did you want to jump in there or do you want me to start? Oh, you can start. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, from the partner side, again, my, I'm a consulting company. And our favorite answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> what, what type, either what level, if you wanted to go by bronze, silver, and gold, and or what maturity level, where you, where you are, are you a growth partner or are you a top performer? Uh, the, the more that uh, you're looking at building that, you know, top performer, building that long range, the more partner people that you, you want involved as well. The challenge becomes um, how many people are sitting at the table. Um, more cooks in the kitchen doesn't necessarily make a better meal. So, uh, uh, we've seen literally two dozen people at a business planning table before, and that's too many. Right? So you really want the executive level, of course, of the partner, which may be, we'd say, two to four people um, from, from your partner, your, their CEO, the sales, their services, marketing kind of has, has a state there. Um, but we, we've seen that grow, even on the partner side, to include six levels of sales teams, two levels of executive, the channel program guys, um, and we've seen 20 people show up at a business planning session, and that's just a lot of investment in time and doesn't necessarily produce a better result. Yeah, I, I would just say, add to that, it, it, as you said, it depends. It's a learning process, right? The, their, their goal is to grow their business, and you want to grow them to grow their business. So the more people that are sitting in the room having the planning meeting, uh, sometimes that's a challenge. The one thing that you have to be careful about, I think, in the silver and, and down is uh, maybe you're meeting with the uh, head of marketing or the head of sales or the EVP, uh, and they may be, may, may be very enthusiastic, but if their goals and the CEO's uh, goals aren't totally aligned, uh, you, you can have some challenges on that. And I think that that's why it needs to be a repetitive process, too, uh, to, to start to find out um, what the what the decision making is like at these at these partnerships? Who really has the capabilities to uh, marshal resources and make sure the organization is moving in the right direction? And it really varies. Um, and as you get into the larger organizations that have multiple divisions, um, you really got to make sure that the uh, the overall alignment of that organization is is behind whatever group you may be meeting with. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I, that, that covers all the questions, I believe. We did include our, our email addresses here on the slide. If there are questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. I'm more than happy to have uh, further conversations surrounding this topic. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the slides will be available on the CCI website under webinars, as well as a recording here on Bright Talk of this webinar. Um, please make use of that. And we also would uh, greatly appreciate your feedback. Uh, you know, we'd like to hear what you think, both the good and the bad. So please take some time, fill out the ratings, let us know um, if this was valuable to us, and, and also what topics you'd like to cover in the future. We're constantly trying to improve uh, the, the quality and content of our webinars. So, so let us know what you think. That would be a, a valuable feedback for us. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great uh, rest of your week.